So, buonasera, good evening. Wir haben, wir sahen den Master Joseph. A big applause. What's the surprise? <laughs> so, good evening. So, you played the song for us. What's, everybody knows the song probably, many people know the song, but what's the meaning of the song? This is Liber Tango. This is Tango for Freedom. And also Tango of uh, Revolution, because uh, Astor Piazzolla uh, brought the music of his time into the future. Thanks a lot for playing. And Joseph, what means drumming for you? You know, you, he's a super uh, conductor. He's from Alicante. He's, uh, he leads the world orchestra and he plays drum tonight to surprise me and us. <laughs> so what is drum means for you as a conductor? No, drums, I've been a drummer much before I was a conductor. Uh, drumming is it's the most organic way of uh, being in contact with music because it's really, it comes from the center of the earth, you know, it's this, this power that pulls you down and makes you young, makes you being alive. Uh, it's really a, a party for the soul, playing drums. Thank you so much, Joseph. We will listen much more to you. Thank you. So, hello, my name is Hans, for those who doesn't know me. Can, I, can everybody from the Global Social Business Summit community raise their hands? Who is here for the summit? Wow, cool. And this is only the opening evening. But where we are here tonight, what we are doing here, this, we will watch a small movie to see the miracle of love and peace. Please, the movie.
Isn't it impressive what a single person can do? Everyone, and everyone in the room is a miracle of life. Look to next to each other, you see it. In every one of us is this capacity. And everyone who are around us. And of course, at the moment, we look a lot and see what is absolutely wrong on the planet. But still, there are miracles happened every day. And sometimes we forgot it. So I'm very happy then Sambik host us for the first evening. And now it's my honor to welcome the founder and the heart and the man of the language of love on stage, Ernesto Oliveri, together with Maria Palmieri. Please, Ernesto. Yes. Sono molto emozionato. I'm very col emotional. Col professore non ci conoscevamo. With the professor we didn't know each other. Ma appena ci siamo incontrati, but as soon as we met, ci siamo abbracciati. We just hugged. Ci siamo tenuti per mano. We kept holding our hands. Quasi a rassicurarci reciprocamente. Almost reassuring each other. Per cui lei resta professore. Ma specialmente un amico. So you are a professor, but you're especially a friend. È un amico, diciamo, benvenuto all'arsenale della pace. And as a friend, I say, welcome to the arsenal of peace. Con tutto il cuore. With all the heart. Con tutta l'amicizia. With all the friendship. Sapendo che la nostra amicizia. Knowing with our, that our friendship. Da ora in poi. From now on. È per sempre. It's forever. Perché lavoriamo per la pace. Because we're working for peace. Perché lavoriamo contro l'ingiustizia. Because we're working against injustice. E noi siamo fatti così, lei e io e noi. We're just made like this. Un applauso. Noi siamo cresciuti oggettivamente a dismisura. We Grazie all'imprevisto. We grew up a lot thanks to uh, unforeseen events. E quando abbiamo colto l'imprevisto, il mondo intero è entrato all'arsenale. And when there were unforeseen events, uh, the whole world entered in the arsenal. Perché il mondo sentiva l'esigenza di trovare casa. Because the world felt the need to find a home. Allora il mondo degli stranieri ci ha fatto dire che è qui nessuno è straniero nella terra di Dio. And the world of foreigners made us say that here nobody is a foreigner in the land of God. Noi dobbiamo sentire, far sentire agli amici amicizia. We need to feel and make our friends feel friendship. Noi conosciamo il loro dramma. We know their drama. Sono dovuti fuggire per fame. They had to run away because per of guerre. Because of war. Per delle ingiustizie paurose. Because of awful injustices. Qui si sono sentiti voluti bene. Here they felt loved. Il mondo dei, dei carcerati e dei poveri. People in prison, poor people. Qui ha capito che ognuno ha diritto a cambiare vita. Here they understood that everybody has the right to change their lives. Ma un, ma un angolo speciale. A special corner. Un'attenzione speciale. Special attention. E per i giovani. And for the young people. Che devono imparare a dire dei sì e dei no. That need to learn to say yes allora and no. Si, si sentiranno, si sentono abbracciati. They feel hugged. Loro possono diventare maestri di questo mondo. They can become teachers of this world. Devono diventarlo. And they have to become. Perché il mondo aspetta dai giovani qualche cosa che finora non è mai apparso. Because the world is awaiting from young people something that never happened. E noi ai giovani diciamo And we say to young people Coraggio. Be brave. L'arsenale della pace vi vuole bene. The Arsenal of Peace loves you. Grazie.
Thank you so much. And we love you. It's Aww. You know, being in the city and being in the city in Turin, what city means? City means the community of citizenship, the community of the citizens. Turin hosts us this year for the Global Social Business Summit. But they host us with so much help, with so much compassion, with so much social creativity. And we are delighted to welcome now two people. Two people from Turin, and who we welcome. So and first of before all, you sell it, this is Maria, and she's our super navigator. Big applause for her. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Benvenuti a tutti. Anche da parte mia. So, now, who okay. we will see now? So, we are first of all here tonight to welcome all of us the mayor of the city of Turin, Stefano Lorusso. So, Professor Yunus, it's, uh, I'm really proud to guest you in our uh, city for this very important uh, meeting for several reasons. <coughs> First of all, is uh, stated by the words, cultivating a culture of peace. It uh, represents a program for, uh, for all of us that are, have a very important big political role. Cultivating means uh, to work on. Uh, it never, uh, we don't have nothing that uh, uh, happen without a programmation, without a, an effort, without a work. And uh, to cultivate is a um, word that means in very, very deep way what we have to do. Culture, because uh, peace needs uh, several action, needs uh, a framework, needs uh, uh, people that uh, work not only on the real uh, concrete uh, actions, but also in terms of thinking, because the uh, very difficult challenges that we have any day in our, uh, in our world means uh, uh, thinking, it means a sort of uh, uh, work on the, what we have to construct. That is a, a work inside our mind and our heart. And peace, because uh, this is a moment very complicated for us. In any place of the world, we have uh, several uh, situations of war or conflicts, and uh, it is really important to start again to talk about peace as a way in which we can live together in our very complicated but very wonderful world. You are a Nobel Prize. I'm really proud that uh, uh, your uh, uh, innovation in the, uh, in the economy has been recognized by the uh, community of the Nobel Prize. But uh, it's really important that you are uh, the leader of a movement, and I welcome also all the delegates that are here for this kind of summit, because social business represents a pillar in the strategy to construct peace. Peace is not only devoted to the speaking, uh, about uh, what, uh, is, uh, um, what we can do in any day needs real things. And uh, social business is a real thing that can construct this culture of peace. So, Professor Yunus and all the delegates, welcome in Torino. Torino is a very uh, historical city in terms of innovation, also in terms of uh, social, in terms of uh, perspective. So, let me thank Ernesto Olivero that is our guest uh, tonight. Ernesto is uh, one of the most important person in the city, and the video that uh, we saw just a few minutes ago represents several times better than my words what is the link and the importance of the uh, Ernesto work, but Ernesto is not alone. Ernesto is the leader of a very big community because all the numbers that we saw are in, uh, have been produced by a lot of people, a lot of Turinese people that work just around him. So, Professor Yunus, thank you very much again. Enjoy your stay in Torino. Thank you very much for all the delegates. And uh, apart from the peace, enjoy also the city because Torino is one of the best cities in Italy. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you. It's, Thank you. It's, it's true. I just talked to Joseph and to other people who see Turin the first time. And they're, What's an incredible city. What's an impression of art. What a hope as a city and to see what we can do. So who will be the next speaker? Of course. So we also have here Guido Bolatto from the Chamber of Commerce, one of our main partners also for this summit this year. Questo funziona, sì. <laughs> so I will start. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Torino, also from the Chamber of Commerce. We, as Chamber of Commerce, are the, the part of business <laughs> in this meeting. Uh, and we are very interested to develop with uh, Professor Yunus and this uh, uh, community uh, we, we how to develop social businesses also uh, uh, in Torino. We create this platform that is uh, called the Torino Social Impact. Uh, five years ago, it works uh, about uh, that. And so we have a lot of points of collaboration with your, uh, with your initiatives. And uh, uh, we are very, Tomorrow we have time to discuss about uh, Torino Social Impact, to present you the platform and uh, all the partners that are part of the meeting tomorrow. Uh, today, the, tonight, uh, is only the time to welcome you uh, in Torino and uh, uh, give our special thanks to Professor Yunus to, to be here and to have a meeting here uh, in Torino. Also for us, uh, we hope uh, we, that you enjoy the city, we take the time to visit uh, also the different part of the city, uh, a social part like this, but not only, and a good stay in Torino for this day. Thank you. Before you leave, before you leave, no, don't, don't leave. Tell us, how many, how many businesses are you representing in the Chamber of Commerce in totally? Um, we uh, rep represent is not the correct part. Uh, member of the Chamber of Commerce are obliged to to uh, is member to to be member. Uh, they have to pay a fee every day. So we are public body. We are uh, part of a public administration of the state because we receive a tax from the enterprises. And in Torino, in the province of Torino, are more than two hundred million, two hundred thousand, two hundred thousand of uh, enterprises, because in Italy we count an, as enterprises also very small business, yeah. uh, like uh, one man, one man company, yeah. Yeah. Family, family company and so on. And, and this for that, that we are very interesting to, to develop the uh, relationship with the Unus Center and also microcredit uh, structure to help these uh, small enterprises to grow and to find opportunity. <laughs> 200,000 business, and everyone can be the most social conscious driven business. And if we look to Turin, and if we look around in the last nine months, I've been many times to Turin, you walk around, and of course, one company who disappeared here, more or less like Fiat, and many other old industrial stuff, leave an enormous let's say, mental emission in the city. So there's a lot to do with these 200,000 companies to stand up and be more social conscience driven and turn it around in the most beautiful city in the sense of social conscience. And now we have the honor to welcome somebody from Bangladesh. Yeah, uh, before that actually, Hans, uh, because youth play a big role. So oh, tonight yes. I invited quite some people. So I'm inviting a bunch of people on stage. Before we have the Bangladeshi. Yeah, very good. Before, yes. We have to welcome, first, uh, first, we first have to welcome him properly, Hans. Oh, so absolutely. please, Duty, Judy, Abdullahi, come on stage. Yes, and with a big applause. Giovanna, Giovanni Petrice. And uh, I think...
can, can somebody more just come here? Let's welcome yeah. Professor Yulis in a proper way. Thank you. Yeah, I yeah. want more yes. young people here. Young challengers, where are you? 3 Zero Club and my big friend. Shazib is going to help me to also moderate this session today. Shazib Islam. Shazib. From oh. YY Ventures. Cheers. Maybe we distribute a bit more like a... So, to explain everyone, before Shazib and you takes over, yes. the young challenger, so the people who are not at the Global Social Business Summit, we hold it now the 12th time, we started 2008, every time we had the young challengers, people who challenge us, people who force us. Don't give up and be the best one of your generation to see how we can turn an idea into reality. That are the young challengers of Turin. And I welcome you personally from our team, from the CCL, from the GUSTI, from the Grameen delegation. You are the most important chapter for us. Every year we become the next generation into social business. Now we can invite our lady. Oh, one lady <laughs> next to the next. Yeah, you know, sometimes if you go to traveling, you have a good karma or you have a bad karma. This time, this lady had a very hard time to arrive here. But we have many people coming from all over the world. We have people from Africa here. We have people from Canada arriving. And now it's my great honor to welcome my boss <laughs> in this way of the social business movement. She, uh, I know her now since 14 years, or 16 years in totally. She leads the Yunus Center in Bangladesh. This is the core who brought us all together. She holds the flag for every Bangladesh in your heart. And mostly welcome the CEO of the Yunus Center, Lamia Moshad. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I want to say that uh, Hans and GCL and Unicenter Center, we've been organizing together now for 10, 12 years, uh, the summit and also the Social Business Day. But I am only one of a 30-member delegation from Bangladesh, representing nearly 50 years of experience in the field of solving social problems and collaboration and creating peace. And I, uh, can I just ask my colleagues to wave the 30... These are, they are the pioneers, they are the pioneers. They have been doing this for 40, nearly 50 years in healthcare, in education, in um, uh, renewable energy, in microfinance, in uh, new entrepreneurship, uh, you name it. And I hope you will use uh, you, this opportunity over the next three days to speak to them because they are the ones who are the powerhouses. But for the important lesson you mentioned, and everyone mentioned that this is a time of crisis, this is a time of big problems, and a world that's being inherited by the young people. So we are here to share what we've done to see if it's useful for you, and also to learn from you what can be done to collaboratively, all of us together, overcome these challenges to create a sustainable world. So thank you very much, Hans, and thank you to everyone, and thank you to Sarmik to have us. Uh, and so I'm told that I have the pleasure to ask Professor Yunus to join us on stage. Hello. Hi. Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Delighted. Oh, come on. Sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. What a great pleasure. What a great pleasure to be here tonight. It's a wonderful occasion. I was surprised when I was here in the morning. This was an arsenal producing weapons to kill people. That's what it did during the First World War. That's what Ernesto told us. And that's what it did in the Second World War. And someone took the lead to transform the whole thing. And instead of producing weapons to kill people, he said this will be transformed to save people. Completely diverse. And today we are here tonight in this particular location to expand 
that idea. Wherever those military industrial complex exist, we transform them, follow Ernesto. If Ernesto can do it, we can all do it. Change the whole paradigm of producing weapons. Those days in First World War, those weapons were simple weapons compared to what they produce now, killed in a massive way. Now they are talking about using nuclear weapons. Wow. With one nuclear weapon, destroy everything. So that's what the challenge Ernesto gave to us. And tonight, is it questioning ourselves, are we ready to take the challenge? That's what we'll be discussing, that's what we'll be talking to each other. Let's give a big applause for Ernesto, who has raised this question. Please stand up. Please, can we give a standing ovation to Ernesto? Please stand up, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. That's the spirit of the whole conference. Thank you. Thank you, Ernesto. Thank you. You raise a fundamental question. And we have to dedicate ourselves to make that happen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we are very happy that we are in Turin. And the mayor of, the young mayor of Turin, greeting us in his city. This is a city where innovations took place. It was a leading city. The innovation is the essence of all human beings doing things in a creative way. That's the lesson I have learned from everything that I have done over the years. How every single human being is packed with unlimited creative power. Unlimited creative power. So Torino stands up as a kind of example how that creative power has been used for this city. We are very grateful, Mr. Mayor, to invite us to celebrate our Global Social Business Summit in this city. Thank you very much. Let's give a big applause for the <laughs> mayor. Thank you. Thank you. And today is the beginning of our journey for the Social Business Summit. We see lots of delegations coming from many different countries. So tonight, I welcome them for the summit on behalf of the summit committee. And give a big applause, please stand up. All the delegates who are participating in this uh, summit, would you please stand up, summit uh, delegates from Bangladesh and other countries. And let's give a big applause, welcome them to the city. Yeah, thank you. We got a lot of delegates here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So what we'll be doing in the summit? This is a very critical moment in history of mankind, not history of Italy or Turin or any single city or a single country. We are in a situation where our existence in question as a human being. Whether we exist or we don't. How long do we exist? That's the question. Are we going to survive for long? Or we become endangered species, most endangered species on this planet? Could human being be endangered species? Do human being deserve it? to be endangered species. What happened to our pride as a human being? The pride that we believed, when we still do, that nothing is impossible for human beings. Nothing is impossible for human beings. All we have to do is to make up our mind. If you make our mind, there's no force, no power in the world which can stop us. Why would you keep taking the decision that we want to live here? This is our home. 
We don't want to see our home destroyed. Not destroyed by somebody else. Destroyed by ourselves. Not destroyed by God. Not destroyed by some other force, external force or whatever. It is us who live in this home. Destroying our own home. And we talk about it all the time. As if this is another discussion point, talking point. Forgetting is question of whether we have a home or not. Some people say maybe human beings go to Mars, find another home. What are we going to do to Mars? We don't want to go to Mars. We want to be here in this planet. This is our home. And we want to make it a beautiful home. Home of our dreams. Why can't we do that? That's the, that's the question we have to answer. That's what the summit is all about. What's wrong? I got involved with in lending tiny little money to poor women in Bangladesh. Everybody knows that story. Focusing on the poorest people on the earth, in the villages, illiterate women, taking little money for survival, working hard to make sure she can use that money, $5, $10, $50 loan. That's about the size of the loan. And he made, she made it happen. And wonderful thing, not only she made it happen, she paid back every penny on the date with interest. You cannot beat her. Not one, not two. They came in hundreds, they came in thousands, they came in millions and did exactly the same thing. That's how I beca it became known. And people keep asking me, why people are poor? What's wrong with them? And I myself try to understand what's wrong with them. I work with them all the time. I don't see anything wrong with them. They're as good human being as anybody else. But why are they poor? Then I realized something. And I said, this is not the explanation why people are poor. As if we are looking at the poor people, why are you poor? I said, I shouldn't be looking at the poor people to find that answer. I should look at the world. What's wrong with you? And I started saying that. Poverty is not created by poor people. Very clear. You look at them, they are as good human beings as anybody else. They're poor. What's wrong? Wrong is not in the poor people. Wrong in the system that we built. Design that we have done for our economy and our concept, all the great theories, great policies. That's what it's wrong. So I said, if you want to address the poor poverty, don't rush to the poor people, because that's not what the poverty is all about. Poverty is what you do. That's what creates the poverty. Change the system. So that's the struggle that we are going through. That's what the summit is all about. How to redesign the entire system. The machine that we built, called economy, is a wrongly designed machine. You can talk about it days and hours and years. Still you have the same answer. It's wrongly designed. It's wrongly designed because it is destroying the planet, our home itself. It's a system which is destroying our planet. Not me, not you. The things that we have to do because that's the system, we got caught into it, that destroys the system, world. So if we want to save the world, save our home, you have to redesign. And I keep reminding people, if you go by the old roads, you always go to the same destination. Old road cannot take you to new destination. It's fixed. Old road to old destination. If you go to, want to go to a new destination, which is different than the old one, if you want to go to a new destination, you have to build new roads. You have no other option. We are trying to find solution by the old roads. We want to do more business. 
We want to run the same all old philosophies. We want to run the same banking, same everything. And you want different results. When you cook food, you know the recipe. The same recipe will give you the same dish. You have the recipe of one dish and you expect something to come out for your table. It's not possible. So that's our challenge. That's what we're going to do. COVID-19 made it very clear. Suddenly, whole world collapsed. The machine stopped. It doesn't function anymore. Everybody was screaming. No, the whole world is collapsing now. We can't let it happen. We have to restart the engine. And there's a whole world talking about it, preparing for it, restart the engine. And they offer what? Bailout packages. You remember all those words, bailout packages? What bailout packages? Some give millions of dollars of bailout packages in a small city. Some give billions of dollars. Government give billions of dollars of bailout packages. Some government came up with trillions of dollars to give the bailout packages, to restart the engine. And I was going around screaming at everybody. Please don't restart the engine. We are so lucky. The engine has stopped. Now this is a good opportunity to build a new engine. It will be so tough if the engine is running and we want to stop it. It's hard work because there will be debates, there will be oppositions. Nobody will try to stop that. Now, COVID-19 luckily stopped it. We didn't have to do anything. So this is our opportunity to create a new engine so that we can create a new world. Because we see a new future for us, not the future which is limited, because we are on the suicidal path. It's a question of time when it's all be finished. It's not a question of whether, whether or not, it's a question of just timing. So we are struggling to create that new world. Not everybody wants to go back to the world world. Then came the vaccine. It showed how wrong the system is. We have been struggling, and I've heard lots of people writing to me from Italy. Please do something about the vaccine. What has to be done? Made it patent free. And I started writing about it. Make it patent free so that it's available to everybody, not hold by, held by big companies. And People supported all across the world, but governments were very reluctant. And finally, many governments, majority of the governments supported, but a handful of government opposed that. It needed unanimous decision to make it happen. That didn't happen, so it couldn't be done. So what happened? All the vaccines went to the rich countries. Ten rich countries got all the vaccines produced by the big companies. Remaining countries in the world, people had no vaccine. People died. Vaccine companies made lots of money, billions of dollars. Their shareholders, their board members became billionaires overnight because of the vaccines. I said, what a shame. This was a direct conflict between making myself rich by making super profit or saving people. World chose and with support from all governments, not all governments, some major governments, to support the profit, not the life. So life is defeated, profit won. That's not the kind of world we want, where profit wins, Life is conceived. We want the life to win, not the money, not the rich people. That's not what we wanted. So we want to create an alternative system where it will be different. And that's what we are trying to bring in today and we're discussing here, a world of three zeros. The current civilization is based on profit maximization. And profit maximization has made human beings like us, good human beings like us, 
into money-making robots. We cannot see anything but money. So we are blinded by money. I said, we forgot that we are human beings. We don't want any civilization which is based on money, maximization of profit. We want a civilization where the whole thing is built on human values. If we consider ourselves as a human being, we should be taking a role of human being in our civilization. That's the civilization that we work for. And we define that civilization by three zeros to start with. Zero global warming. In that civilization, there'll be no global warming because we're not running for money. Running for money creates the global warming. If you stop that, global warming will disappear right away. So we want to create that world through social business. We don't abandon business, but we create a new kind of business. Business to solve problem. That's where the creativity of human beings come up. We have enormous creativity, but we're not using for the purpose that we need. So we want to make sure we create the world to create a world of three zero, zero global warming, zero wealth concentration. All the wealth goes to few hands. This is a built-in feature of the engine that we have. Money doesn't stay down. Money goes up to the top people, few people. People at the bottom don't get anything. And it continues. That's not the kind of world we want. So we want to build a world where money, the wealth, and the people live together, not separated out. And it can be done. That's what the discussion in the summit, how it is done, how it's been shown, demonstrated, can be done. And there'll be no unemployment, zero unemployment. Zero wealth concentration, zero global warming, zero unemployment. That's the three zero we'll be talking about. But how do we get it? Such a huge task. I said, task is huge. And we are huge too, in number of people. All we have to do, take personal actions. And we chose the young people to begin because their mind is still fresh. This is the home they have to live for long because older generation is on the way out. So they are the one who will be facing it. The world is disappeared, destroyed. They are the one who will be suffering right here from beginning. So we addressed them. We said, why don't you create three zero clubs? Very simple idea, three zero club. Very simple because it needs only five young people, not 5,000 or 5 million or something, just five young people. Five young people can form a three zero club. That's all. What do the three zero club will do? The members of the three zero club, each one of them will commit on one thing. What is the thing? The commitment is my contribution to global warming, I'll bring it to zero. Just my contribution as a member. Five of them will say the same thing. My contribution to global warming, I'll bring it to zero as soon as possible, as fast as possible. And my contribution to wealth concentration, I'll bring it to zero. My contribution to unemployment, I'll bring it to zero. So we get the steps how it is done. So all five members of the club will become three zero persons, meaning they have no contribution in global warming, no contribution in wealth concentration, no con contribution in uh, unemployment. If you can succeed, and they will succeed, because it's a commitment they can keep, it's the steps that we see it can be done. Then we create three zero families with the young people. And this will lead to three zero villages, three zero cities, Hopefully, Turin will someday will become a three zero city. Why not? That make a commitment that I will not contribute to global warming. That's all the commitment there is. It's not the government, it's not the, some sup, uh, regional association of governments and so on. No, just me, individuals. Contribution to global warming to bring zero. And if you can do that, bring global warming and unemployment and wealth concentration to zero, for a city to create a world of three zero will be just one more step, tiny little step, because you have already done the base. So that's the encouragement, that's the discussion we'll be having with the young people here, and hopefully 
they will see how it can be done and we'll be discussing how to make sure now. I'm very happy. We started only recently this 3-0 club. Already about 500 clubs have been created in about 38 countries. Yes, 38 countries. It's already done. So that's a good start. We'll be discussing it here. And welcome to the summit. Let's create the three zero world. And this is our commitment. We'll make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Yunus. So before I leave the mic to the next generation, I want to introduce some characters in the room who is also from the social business community and support us. First, I would like to introduce you to a good friend who did everything in Italy for us for the last 16 years, Vincenzo Caruso. Your really commitment to a great friend for all of us. Please stand up. No, no, you are the Mr. Italian for social business. No, thanks a lot, Enzo. And next to him is a lady. She committed her whole life to the next generation. Welcome from the One Young World, Kate Robinson. Kate, you do a miracle. And there is a man in this room who risks every day his life for enlightening Africa. And he just come all the way from Senegal today Trust and Schreiber, a super social entrepreneur, Africa Green Tech. Thanks a lot. And tomorrow we will meet much more, but let me introduce you to Antonella May Pochler. She really supports us a lot, super strategist. Thanks a lot what you do for us. And uh, enjoy the time here. And now I give my mic to the next generation. And uh, they do it anyway, in a better way. And uh, wish you all a good discussion with the next young challenger. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Shazib, I think something is missing for the 3 Zero Club. So, Professor Yunus, we organized a little living room. There's a lot of questions. Uh, we are receiving more on Instagram on our channels. So, we can start our conversation. But first, Shazib. I leave the floor to you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Shazib. I work as the CEO at Trees at Global Center. Professor Yunus, this evening, uh, we are going to have this living room set up conversations. And don't worry, we also care about you. We are also going to have conversations for you. And we have to open the Tree Zero Club convention. And right here, we have the part one. And on day two of GSBS, we do part two. You have mentioned about 500 clubs, almost 500 clubs in 38 countries. Would you like to meet, and all of you, to some of our friends who are already becoming 3-0 persons? Say yes. Yes. Not interested. Yes. yes. Shall we watch the video?
Yasin Zahir, and I'm from the United States. I'm a part of an organization called Nourish Our Earth, and our primary goal is to increase awareness about the environment and protect our planet. We do this by encouraging people to plant trees in their backyards or in local parks, or also by cleaning beaches in our vicinity. We help reduce carbon emissions in our world by increasing the amount of trees we plant and encouraging a larger, healthier lifestyle as a whole. And that's why we hope to achieve a world with zero carbon emissions. Hello po, ako po si Keeper Rehe from Apollo City, Philippines at ang aming pong initiative ay ang pangangalaga sa ating kagubatan ng ating forest. Ang layunin po ng aming grupo ay ang pangalagaan ng kagubatan, koneksyonan nito para magsilpig tahanan ng ating mga hayop at mabawasan ang carbon emissions dito sa aming lansan. My name is Fabian, I am from Deutschland and our project is One Safe a Day. One Safe a Day is a mobile app that helps you every day a good thing for the environment. This also brings you to the goal of zero carbon emissions. Hello everyone, I am Tamsin Rushi, Bolsi Bangladesh TV. Our project is called Bleed with Pride. Menstrual Health and Hygiene in Bangladesh is a very important part of the project. It is a very important part of the project that we have to do with awareness and education. Our project is Zero Carbon Emission and Zero Poverty in Bangladesh. We are going to be in Tanzania. We are going to be in Tanzania. We are going to be in the area of the plastic. We are going to be in plastic and we are going to be in the area of the container. We are going to be in the area of the container and we are going to be in the area of the container. We are going to be in the area of the container and we are going to be in the area. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Sadaf Qadir, I am from Pakistan. My three zero club is working on the students. They are working on the students, but they are working on the same way that you and me are working on the same way. They tell us that the people in society are working on the same way. They can meaningfully contribute in the same way. And in this way, we have the three zero club main objective that we have to achieve zero unemployment. Sunana Abdullah Ibrahim Mekanu daga Nigeria. Nini nike running social business center na Nigeria. Sannan babban bure mu shine kawo karshen unemployment wato muna so mu tabbatar da an samu zero unemployment a doran kasa. Together we are creating resilience. Thank you. And a small, in, a small invitation to all of you, all our friends who are between 12 to 35, just visit 30.club and check this out. If you are 35 plus, don't worry. You can become a support person, create a support organization, and support the movement. Over to you, Maria. Thank you. It's amazing what you guys have been doing in only like more than one year. It's just amazing. And we have the honor of having like one of the first 3-0 club members, Duti, I know you have a question for Professor Yunus. We're going to start our round of questions here. We have so many, Professor Yunus. <laughs> so, Riti, maybe introduce also yourself. So, peace be upon, upon everyone. Hi, I'm Duti. I'm from Bangladesh. So, it is impo immensely important for me to have a peace generation because, and it's a question I ask myself often, is that, if not now, when? And if tomorrow, how? No one knows. So it starts with us, and it starts now. And the question I ask, uh, I want to ask Dr. Mohamed Yunus today is, could you give us a glimpse of the young Yunus, probably in his early 20s? How did he perceive himself and the world around him? And what was his mindset? Thank you. For one thing, whatever I was doing as a young person, I was not planning to become a banker. <laughs> but ultimately, I became a banker. So it was not on my radar in any case, wherever it is. Uh, so this is a very strange turn of things. Uh, you don't plan something, but you get involved with it, very deeply involved in it. And that's happened in my case, and I, I'm happy about that, those uh, twists. Uh, as a young person, I was uh, doing all kinds of things, um, as a, any young person anywhere will do, very curious about things. And I got involved with um, many um, different kinds of activities within the school. I became Boy Scout. That gave me an opportunity uh, which uh, brought a lot of uh, experience for me. I started joining Jamburis, which were all the Boy Scouts will be getting together. 
So one of the uh, most impactful jamboree that I attended when I was 15 year old, I attended a eight world jamboree in Canada. So young person of 15 year old going to Canada, it's the most exciting thing to happen. We don't leave your village actually. Now jumping out everything and go to Canada and so on. And most, again, an important thing, not only I went to Canada, uh, our program was done in such a way by our planners in the Boy Scout movement that we, in order to save money, not to fly over the Atlantic, they decided to send us by ship. It's a beautiful ship, uh, Italia. That was the name of the ship. <laughs> you know where it's from. <laughs> it's a beautiful ship. And we enjoyed it so much, crossing the whole Atlantic. It took 15 days to get there. And on the way back, we took the ship back again to come to Plymouth in uh, UK. And to save money on the plane fare, because it's very expensive to pay for all these young people. So we came to Germany, to bought three microbuses. Imagine that. To drive back to my country, crossing over the whole Europe and the Middle East and so on. And we did. It took us six months. <laughs> we, the reason it took six months because we decided to go to the city, wherever we found interesting city, drive it there. Because we are free people. <laughs> we had so much experience meeting people, young guy coming from Bangladesh, not knowing what the rest of the world is. Now go deep into this world. This is 1955. 1955 means about 10 years after the World War. So still the world, all the devastation of the World War is all around. And how people are struggling to make a living out of the debris of the World War and so on. So we saw all these things, raised a lot of questions. Every day I wrote my diary recording everything that I've seen and so on. That transformed me completely. So I was a lucky guy to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm so tempted to ask her this question. Uh, I met Duti in our incubation program in Dhaka. When everybody is just studying, of course, education is the backbone of our development. You also started something on your own. You became an entrepreneur. So does your friends and family say you are so young, why do you have to become an entrepreneur? Thank you so much for the question. And I was reflecting back on another program that I'm incubating in. And we were in the breakout room. Everyone is using Zoom right now, so I don't have to explain what a Zoom, uh, breakout room is. So um, we were just introducing ourselves and how we are doing our businesses. And at one point, uh, the whole room became a comfort zone for everyone, and people were really sharing what goes on to the world of entrepreneurship. It's not just about you know making money, impacting people, you have to get the idea of who you are and accommodate your mental peace as well. So I was talking about how it's mentally debilitating. It can be hard for a young person to fit into a world that is dominated by the older generation. And while it's not just the older generation, it's a race against the time as well. Like people around you are doing so much and you are this very young person who comes from a lower middle income family and for a nerdy female who was expected to become a doctor in Bangladesh, suddenly wasted her potential in doing something that has not uh, direct outcomes. Like the entrepreneurship world, you don't, you can't really expect direct, direct outcomes, right? So there was this 52 year old women who talked about, you know, you still have a lot of time, um, don't worry. But the thing is, um, I am not com competing against other people. I'm competing with myself. And if you don't compete with yourself, you don't reflect on your progress. And I have been um, in a position where I was like, you know, I still have time, I should be doing this, I, or have all the time in the world, but 
that time was the most depressing time of my life. Like not doing anything, it was the most depressing thing. And uh, I think people who are neurodivergent in the room, people who have ADHD, autism, can really relate how this thing works. Like you can't just st sit still and do nothing about the things that's happening around you. So my social business was not just a thing that I started doing on a whim. Uh, so um, I just um, graduated from high school and um, I decided that, you know, I'm going to go to this dream university of mine in Bangladesh, but it required a hefty lot of money, lot of money to, you know, pay the tutors. And I realized suddenly my parents broke to me that my father lost his job and my mother is going to retire within two years. So I started looking for avenues to make money. I was already work working in a startup in Bangladesh and the good thing about Bangladesh, the Bangladesh startup ecosystem is that they are really investing on the young people. So this startup gave me an opportunity to learn and I thought of, you know, in implementing what I learned into growing something of my own. So I was strolling down my mother's garden and saw that she has basically created an urban jungle by propagation and we need to get rid of some of them. And I just casually opened a Facebook page, but I implemented what I learned in the startup. So six months into the business, I saw that there was significant revenue, but we struggled generating more revenue because um, the customers that we retained throughout the six months were basically my friends who were in their early 20s and they just wanted to support their young friend, but there weren't any people outside my bubble. So I researched the market a bit and learned that people really don't know how to plant and they don't want to kill plant because here's the thing, you buy a $5 plant and you kill it. No one wants to, who, no one wants to kill a $5 plant, right? So we started basically a plant school. Right now, how I pitch the idea in like, you know, an elevator pitch style is that Plantizy is basically a platform where we're promoting permaculture in urban settings. And Making you buy a plant is only the start or the middle of the conversation we are trying to have around environmental cautiousness. So this is Plant Easy. This wow. is Duti. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so everyone will buy a plant. Thank you, Duti. Uh, Professor Yunus, I, I want you now to intro introduce uh, Judy. I had the chance to meet her amazing husband and then the chance to meet her. Uh, when I was working in Rome, and then she joined our program, Young Challenges program. I know you have some interesting story and question to ask. Thank you, Mary, and uh, I'm so thankful that I have this great chance to meet Professor Mohammed Yunus, and also uh, to be there here with you. Uh, uh, my name is Judy Tozan. Uh, I am a social entrepreneur from Syria. Uh, I don't know which is the question or uh, answer of my question. I know you have a question as well. Very nice. <laughs> yes, so I will start with a question, uh, Mr. Muhammad Yunus. I know there's a lot of uh, dreams that you hope to happen to the humanity, but I would like you to mention one thing you would like to happen in your lifetime to the whole humanity. Thank you. Creating three zero world. That's what we want. <laughs> and we'll make it happen. Uh, actually, I, I would like you, if you don't mind, to give us an answer with details. Because I know this question is a little bit you can answer in general. I, I hope the humanity to have a peace. This is so general. But maybe you have a smart dream. And you can uh, let us know more about it. Yeah. Uh, the peace is something uh, is born out of. Peace is not something just suddenly uh, happened. Uh, you, you plant the seed, 
of peace and gradually it will bring peace. It will not, I sit there and suddenly peace will prevail on me. It will not happen like that. So first of all, you have to find out what causes the breach of peace. Why people go into wars? Why people go into conflicts? Why people kill each other? What are the, you make a list. You, you, anybody can make a list. Why people go to war, why people uh, go into conflict. And some of these wars become global wars, like the World War I, World War II, and so on. But there are so many other wars. So if you have that list of uh, all the problems that you have, so try to see if you can destroy at the very beginning of the creation of the conflict and creation of the war by removing it. Like one of the cause of the conflict and wars is economic reason. You want to grab other country because they have some very um, strong resource in their control. You want to grab that. If you have oil, you are in danger. Somebody in your neighbor or even outside come and find an excuse to attack you and grab that or control that. Not uh, directly, but through other means to control the country so that they have access to that uh, uh, resource that you have. Uh, there's many such things. So how to make sure uh, that kind of thing doesn't exist? You don't grab each other's things. Uh, that's why we have to redesign the system that grabbing is not a solution. Uh, so we talk about creating social businesses where you don't want to grab, you want to help by business rather than grab things to the business. Uh, so what kind of thing it would be? And we talk about creating entrepreneurship rather than jobs because a job make you blunt it away from your creative power. So you don't have any creative power left when you take a job. Uh, we said human beings are packed with unlimited creative capacity. So how to use that creative capacity? Uh, is entrepreneurship. Human beings uh, are packed with unlimited creative capacity. That's how we are born. So we focus on that. So these are steps that you take. To remove the, blunt the issues that which make you, force you, encourages you to attack other countries and other people and so on. And also change the education system because all the things that you're talking about is in the education system. You have to get into the heads of the young people like you so that you remember, know that uh, this is the kind of world we want. In education system, there is no discussion about what kind of world you want. You say how to stay in the current world. They don't talk about future world. So you have to, in the education system, they have to encourage you, each one of young people, each one of the students, what kind of world you like to be in. It's imagination. So we emphasize on imagination, imagination of a world that you want to live in, so that you know which is the right approach to go there and which, is a destroy, which will destroy the world that you want to build. So you control yourself to do the things so that you can make it happen. So I'm saying, it's, it's a, you, in order to create a new civilization that I was talking about, in order to create a new civilization, you need a new culture of peace. Peace is not something that comes in this kind of piecemeal way. It's a whole totality of the culture you create, what kind of behavior you do with each other, what kind of relationship you build with each other. So um, enormous varieties of issues that you have to build inside of you, inside your community in the society. So that's why culture of peace becomes so important part of it, so that we can create that world of three zeros. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Professor Yunus. Uh, I'm connecting to what you said about this culture of peace and this creative power that you have like in trying to find solutions to different problems. And this is a bit what we experienced these days that we were here at CERMIC. So we really wanted to invite also some volunteers from CERMIC, that, like young people spending really like a lot of passion here to, to really help people. And I have here Giovanni. Giovanni, you have a very nice question as well. Thank you, Maria. Good evening, Professor. Yes, um, over the years here, we discovered and experienced um, how giving back was the economic engine for the transformation of this enormous arsenal war. And this concept was born here 
and where hundreds of thousands of people of all ages um, are willing to donate their time, their expertise, um, their resources uh, to help, to help others. So this also have probably an economic value. In, for you, in, in your opinion, Dr. Yunus, can this model say something to the economy in general? Well, in general, I would say that uh, uh, it's a, some starting point in the designing of the system, that overall uh, framework that you have. So that's the most important thing, how the concepts and the framework that you exist. Uh, as I was saying, that the, in the entire education system, there is no discussion about what kind of world you want to build. So that question doesn't come into your mind as, an, as, as a subject that you worry about, discuss among your friends in your class, what kind of world. Then you'll see each one has a different idea of the world that you want to be. Uh, and you debate, discuss. At the end of the year, as you close the year, uh, you write a common paper where uh, you see the basic elements of your, what you have discussed is put there and say this is 2022. Uh, our class decided on these features of the new world and keep it. Next year, go through the whole process and then debate whether you still believe in this or you want to add and change things. And at the end of the 2023, you said, this is our class decided, reviewed the past ones, we added this one, deleted this one. We had, we thought this is much better world. This is our consensus that we have. So you're building it up in your mind. Today, you finish your school, look for a job. And you got the job, then your mind is completely closed because you don't have to think because job orders you what to do. You become a kind of a slave to carry on orders. You lost your human identity, what makes you a human being. You, it makes you a human being because you have all the creative capacity. If you surrender that creati creative capacity, you turn into a slave. You turn into non-human being. You're not a human being anymore. So that's why we keep saying that encourage the uh, character that you want to become an, a creator, an entrepreneur. You decide what kind of entrepreneurship you want to go with. You want to make money for yourself, fine. That's an entrepreneurship, do it. But if you want to change the world, create social business or do both. Part of you do the money-making business so that you can take care of yourself. And part of you want to create social business and create ideas about social business. Uh, even if you're not doing it yourself, you say, this is a framework of a new social business that I thought of, somebody can come and invest in that business, I'll be happy to be associated with it. So this is, this is the step by step. If young people start making that, taking that steps, the whole world will be changed. Thank you. Well. <laughs> Professor Yunus, let me jump on here. Giovanni, great question. So if you reflect on your last week, did you have any such discussion with your friends that you wanted to do, like a small action? Yes, with my fellow, we are studying a master in international cooperation. Uh, we were asking how we can change the world. And I completely agree with Professor because i aware that a real change, we can have a real change only if we start from education, from a concrete action, thinking in great, but doing at the same time. We need person really convinced of what they are saying. We need people, strong people, well prepared, able to face, to cope, to address a real problem with a concrete action in life. We need that. And to answer the first question, I think we have, we don't have any time to change the world. Climate change wars are telling us that we have to act now. Thank you so much. Like, Professor, yeah. like Professor Yunus, you always talk about small steps, tiny steps solving one problem. Also to reflect on Judy, what you were saying, like our board member, Lamia Morshed Apu, you just heard her speak. We were having this conversation on a 3-0 club meeting 
and we were talking about small actions. She said, just plant a tree. And we have a friend, and you just also met her. They're from France. They created an app. It's called One Save a Day. And I'm like, OK, give us some ideas. What are the things that we all can do? He's like, take shorter showers. Every day, if you shorten your shower, you save a lot of water. You know, small things. Over to you, Maria. Thank you, Shaziv. I have also Beatrice from Cermig. What small steps do you do here? And give you a question. Well, we meet each other this morning. <laughs> I don't know if you remember of me. Yes, yes here in Cermig, I'm um, a young who is growing up in this house. I have the lucky uh, of this. I have the lucky to have a big teacher with me who helping me to grow up. So this is, and yes, um, this is the reason why my question arise from the experience of ceramic, from the history of this house. Well, everybody knows that arm trade and also uh, research in the military fields have been considered the engine of the economy, a driver of the economy. But on the uh, other hand, we have ceramic, the example of ceramic. Uh, because the ceramic transform a military arsenal into a house of peace and development where the aim is to create a world where no arms have to be built. So, Professor Yunus, my question is, uh, what do you think about the military economy and also about the economic convenience of peace as well? As I was saying, that imagination is something very important for a human being. Um, so let your imagination be as far flung as possible. Um, the more uh, it's impossible you think, more is the more attractive imagination you have. Uh, so if you are imagining that we want to create a world where there'll be no war, war is something people don't. What is war? They used to have wars. Why people used to fight that? The, it will be tough time, teacher explaining why people used to fight. Because kids said, well, why do they fight? Why didn't they resolve the problem by discussions and uh, having their own format and so on and so forth. The reason I'm saying that, we, as we imagine a world created by us taking those small steps, that will be a world where military will not exist. We don't need it. So I'm not talking about what military should do. The whole idea of military should not exist. This country in the, in, right now, which doesn't have military, no defense system, just free from any military establishment. Yeah. So it's possible to make that happen. So can't extend it. Why should anybody to prepare to kill somebody? And with the state support, why do we do that? What is the problem that we cannot resolve as a human being sitting together or make a mechanism how to do that kind of thing? If we spend enough time, we'll find a way how to resolve problem. Problem of some conflict, some dis disagreement about something, something about borders, something you did to us, and so on. Let's sit down, make it happen so that we can resolve this question. So, so I will not discuss what military can do. Uh, in my scheme of things, military doesn't exist. So I'll be creating a world where there'll be no military. Ne need for military will not exist because we don't want them to give their life. Why young people go and give their life or kill somebody else of his age uh, for a purpose? He probably doesn't even understand what the purpose is. So that's the kind of thing that we would like to do. So let's imagine that. And the emphasis that I give, if we imagine Someday it will happen. If we don't imagine, it has no chance. Because you don't imagine how can it happen. So let's imagine as wide as possible so that someday we make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Beatrice. Thank you, Professor Yunus. So military for us it doesn't exist. We just erase it. Uh, I have a special person as well here. Uh, I met him uh, with a project that I did with the Global Shapers community uh, in Rome. Uh, I met him as a 
Heroes Never Sleep. That was the name of the project. That because there's those people that are really like uh, uh, doing so much for their community that sometimes they don't have time to sleep, you know. So this was uh, the idea. Uh, Abdullahi, uh, I know you have some interesting questions and a very interesting story. I will translate the question. Buonasera a tutti e a tutti. Sono molto felice di essere qui. Saluto un amico Ernesto Oliviero e amici e amiche di Ceramic. Io... Vai. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm here as a friend of Ceramic, uh, of the Friends of Turin. Prima di fare le due domande che mi sono preparato, eh, vi presento, io sono Abdullahi Ahmed. Before asking my questions, let me introduce myself. I'm Abdullahi Ahmed. Sono nato in Somalia e ho conosciuto la guerra a tre anni. I was born in Somalia and I met war when I was three. Ho vissuto per 16 anni nella guerra civile a Somala. Ho vissuto nella guerra civile a Somala. I uh, grew up for 13 years in the civil war in Somalia. Sono stato un richiedente asilo, un rifugiato. I came as a refugee. E ho conosciuto la pace una volta arrivato qui in Italia e in Europa. And I met peace once I arrived here in Italy and in Europe. E oggi sono consigliere comunale della città che mi ha accolto. And today I'm the chancellor of the city that hosted me. E ho, sono molto emozionato di avere questa opportunità per fare alle due domande che mi sono iscritto al professor Mohamed Yunis. And I am very emotional now to ask you these two questions. La prima riguarda sul tema della cultura. The first one uh, concerns the theme of culture. Pensa che le differenze culturali possono influenzare lo sviluppo economico di una comunità e di un paese. Do you think that cultural difference might influence the sustainable development of a land, of a country? E quale potrebbe essere il ruolo dei giovani con bangra migratorio o passata migratorio nello sviluppo economico e culturale di un paese? And what do you think can be the influence that people uh, with an immigration background uh, can have in developing that specific country? Well, well to uh, talk about culture, is a, culture is something, a social environment that you create for achieving things that you want to achieve. So if it is supportive of your ideas of future and what you want to do, first you have to create that environment the culture around you which supports it. That's where your, um, what you, how you grow up in the family is very important. What kind of education you get through, because they, you, all the cultural values you in, extract from your growing up, and also the environment around you, what you get, that's what prepare you to achieve the things that you, are, uh, you want to achieve. So it's, if you have a culture of something else, and uh, you are looking for uh, not consistent with the culture that you have, you never achieve that because you, your support system is missing completely. That's why if you want to achieve peace, you have to have the supportive cultural environment so that you have a common understanding among each other. That's the culture is all about. How to facilitate me to achieve the goals that I want to achieve. So that's value of the culture. It's very important con con in the context of what you want to achieve what you want your children to achieve. You have to prepare the ground for that. So that's the kind of steps you have to take so that the efforts of young people become fruitful in the achieving things in the context of the environment that you create beforehand. Thank you. In fact, with the association Abbiamo fondato nel 2018, si chiama Generazione Ponte. And indeed, with the, an association that we created in 2018, it's called Generation Bridge. E insieme a me ci sono tanti altri ragazzi provenienti da quattro continenti. And with me there are like young people coming from over four continents. Uniti però eh, accomunati dal desiderio di creare ponti tra generazioni e culture differenti. And we are united by the desire of creating these bridges between generations coming from different cultures. Ora ho un'altra domanda che riguarda la pace, ma un po' personale. Now se I mi posso another, permettere. 
Now I have another question that always concerns peace, but it's a bit more personal. Lei ha vinto il premio Nobel per la pace e non quella dell'economia, nonostante lei sia il fondatore del microcredito. So, you, you won the Nobel Peace Prize, even if you are the founder of microcredit, so you didn't win the economy prize. <laughs> Secondo lei, qual è la correlazione tra il sviluppo economico e il mantenimento della pace? And therefore I'm asking, what is the connection between develop, uh, economic development and maintenance of peace? This question should be addressed to the Nobel Committee. <laughs> well, the P Nobel Committee for Peace have their ideas what this prize is for, who should get it. So they thought addressing the question of poverty in a way, address in a way, transforming the entire um, thinking around banking is a contribution to peace because you're addressing the, um, uh, what do you say, uh, the ticking time bomb of poverty because if you continue with poverty, it explodes sooner or later. So you're addressing that before it explodes and resolve it, cool it down so that you are avoiding the conflict, you're avoiding the social upheaval because people will not going to lie around and watch everything happening, nothing happening to them. So they will be rebel at one point. And social uh, unhappiness and um, disgruntled people will take any action uh, to make it happen, make it uh, express themselves that they, they're unhappy about it. So that way they thought this is a good initiative that uh, microcredit has done, addressing the problem of poor people. And it is not government money as a donation or something, which is a traditional way of doing that. It's a welfare kind of payments. We have done it. They appreciated it that as a business way. So it is sustainable. It, it, it runs by its own juice. It doesn't bring something from outside. So that's another aspect of it. Probably it influenced. And they, in their speech, explaining why they have selected me as a Nobel Prize winner, they explained all that. So the, the explanation is very simple. But since uh, Nobel Committee on Economics didn't have to make any statement because they never gave me any uh, Nobel uh, Prize for Economics, so we don't know why they have not done that. What, what is the thing that they think about uh, deserving for uh, economics prize, uh, economic prize for the uh, Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize for econ Economics? So that is... Uh, you can guess, you can make uh, your own conjecture what this may be. This, uh, we don't know about what happened in their, in their sense of uh, judgment, how it should be judged, who should get it and who shouldn't. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Grazie. All right. Thank you so much. Professor Yunus, now it's time to wrap up this part of this conversation. Well, thank you. It's, uh, yeah. I, I'm very happy to talk uh, to you and uh, uh, responding to your questions and so on. My idea is uh, young people like you, they represent a big power, not just tiny power. A, uh, there are many sources of power, but I see uh, in transformation of society, the young people uh, is the most powerful group of uh, people in the world who can bring very substantial change, very quick change in the society. Uh, that is appreciated, understood, not only in this generation, many generations before, that the youth is a force that can challenge the existing uh, status quo and redesign things and uh, make things happen, make changes. And many in history, many such events took place. But what I want to add there, I said that the present generation of young people is different than the previous generations of young people. For one thing, this generation of young people, I would say even uh, this generation of young people is the most powerful generation in the history of mankind. No other young generation was as powerful as you are. Why? Is it because you are smarter than other young people? No, we are the same as the other generation. What distinguishes you from the other generation is 
you are empowered by a new technology, very powerful technology, which never existed before. And it came to you suddenly. All the things that happened, uh, it exploded in your generation. So suddenly, whatever you think, it can explode. You can go, you reach out. Today you talk here, suddenly somebody on the other side of the world listening to you and talk back to you right away. It doesn't take time. And many such technologies that you have makes you very powerful. Your decisions, your ideas, your th thinking process communicate to each other. That's what we have been explaining by saying in the 3-0 club, if you take one little action in your club, which is only five members in your neighborhood, that's all. But you communicate in networking at other clubs around the world because you have the network, you have the uh, communication mechanism through what you communicate with you, and that explodes. If it touches the mind the same way that it touched you, they say, okay, we're here. So for you, it was a small little step. But the fact that you took that little step kind of expanded globally, and suddenly it became a bigger step. And it really shaken up the whole uh, world in a completely different direction. That's the power you have. And I try to remind young people, are you aware of this power? Because everybody goes, okay, you go to school, get your grades, move on, get a job. Done. My job is done. It's not done. So if you repeat that thing, nothing will happen to the world. But if you pay attention to this and take action, even a tiny little action, suddenly it becomes a big action because of the technology, the power of technology. So I said, you, you are not only young people, you are also in the sense of genie of Aladdin Slam. You remember, Disney can do anything. So you have the power of doing anything, that you are the genie. You become aware of your power, that I know how much power I have. If you know that, the question you'll be asking yourself, what use I make of the power? That question probably many young people don't think. They say, okay, I know, I know how to do that. But the fact is, what is the use I want to make? If I don't use my power, what happens to the power? Just waste it away. You had the power, you never used it. So if you become aware I have the power, you have to think very seriously what use I make of it so that you make the best use of your power. Before next generation comes, you, know, you missed your chance. The next power generation will be more powerful than you because they will have more technology and the benefit of what has happened in the meantime, they will be ready for that. So don't miss your chance. That's the whole thing. So little step you take is, oh, well, this is a tiny little step. That tiny little step will change everything. And that's very important step. No matter what you do, you can expand globally. And it touch many young people in many cultures, many different directions, and unite the young people on that one issue that you raised. That's the chance you have. Use that power. Don't miss it. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Talking about the power of technology. So we are maybe 200 people here in this room, a little over 200 people. We didn't want to you know, keep this evening just within ourselves. Technology came in to rescue. On Instagram, we have been broadcasting it, and our friends also have questions for you. As I read them, <laughs> the first one is very funny. Was there a time when you thought that you will not continue to build social businesses? If not, what was your motivation to continue it? Oh, I was very excited about the whole idea of social business, that you can do things and solve people's problem in a sustainable way, in a business way. So I never had a chance to kind of withdraw from it. Uh, you may say, well, did you have doubts about it? I never had any doubts about it. I, didn't give it a name called social business. We started the business first, not name and theories. Those things came later. People, because people keep asking me, oh, that doesn't look like a business. What kind of funny thing you're doing? So I have to go on explaining what it is. 
And in that explanation, repeated the defense of what I do and saying how exciting thing it is. And I thought I need to put a level on it so that I can communicate better. So that's when we started thinking about that. Initial level that I gave for, we gave for a couple of years or maybe three years, used to call social consciousness driven business. That's the level I put, social consciousness driven business. So I used it for a while. Then I realized that it's too long, too complicated. Make it shorter. So I said, it's a social business. So that's how the social business came into being. And I see the benefit in it. And I see the response coming to it. And it also, I got very excited that not only we do it, many others are doing it uh, to see that how it can happen. Recently, Patagonia, the big company in uh, Spain, a uh, multi-billion dollar international, multinational company. Uh, the owner decided to hand over this business to solve the problem of uh, global warming. One issue, an entire business is handed over to uh, a new company dedicated to addressing global warming. This is a multi-billion dollar company. They have millions of dollars profit every year. So in one stroke of pen, his signature is given, this turned into a social business because I'm not interested in taking one penny out of my own company. I had 100% ownership, I have zero ownership. Why? Because I've dedicated the whole company in solving problems, that's it. So again, another example that came out as a social business. And along our history, we have partnership with big companies like Danone, creating social business. We were very excited because uh, the fact that a company like Danone can make a decision like that and defend it over many, many shareholders. And not only defended it, shareholders supported it. Employees supported it 100%. So that shows it's not only something that I'm talking about, you're talking about, they feel it inside the company. And it's still continuing that that feeling that they want to create more social business. This is only one social business they did with us, but they have done social business across the globe because of the fund that created uh, by creating this social business with us. And then McCain has created social business, McCain Canadian company. Uniqlo has created social business. So many multinational companies created social business along the side, many are discussing about it and so on. So an idea, in the beginning, that people were making fun of social business. Oh, nobody will do that. Suddenly, filled the hard-nosed people uh, of the business world looking for us. Now, given the circumstances of the world now, because our journey is going to end very soon, uh, and that threat and that real possibility that we may not exist on this planet, making people, hard-nosed business people, think twice to see is this the business which will save us. They see, no, we have to re redesign the business world. The redesigning business world is a common discussion right now. So their social business comes up as a topic of discussions. Even, I don't know who they are, but they are discussing it because this is what they see as a possibility of protecting the world because business can solve problems. That's, that's a great thing about it, provided you withdraw your profit motive from that. Profit motive kind of derailed the whole purpose of the business because it's only for you, not for the world. So the moment you put on this track, on the social business track, suddenly the whole creative power that the business has can go into addressing the problem which exists and makes people's life very complicated on this planet. So I'm very happy about that. That's a, uh, the idea of social business continued. And young people love that. That's why universities are creating social business center. You, they call it the UNIS Social Business Center. More than 100 universities around the world created those centers. So I'm sure uh, one of the university here, and uh, you can mention that, uh, will be uh, announcing creation of UNIS Social Business here in Turin. So that also shows that hard-nosed academics it's very difficult to change their mind, what they have learned from their own academic world, uh, to get a, get a new idea into it. But they're responding to it in a very positive way. So I'm very happy with that. Thank you. Yes, 
the University of Turin, together with many departments, is creating a UNO Social Business Center, exactly. Thank you so much. Okay, so we yeah, have one last question. Um, it talks about a particular incident, um, but this has another question associated to it. I believe you have already answered it, so I will not go there. But when I reflect on this moment, I was at my high school, I was watching TV with my father, and then I saw a, a man from my country own a Nobel Prize. I was so proud. And how did you feel when you own a Nobel Prize? Uh, well, very exciting news for everybody. Uh, the whole uh, country, Bangladesh, the moment the announcement came on the television, electrified, totally. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, when you celebrate something with your happiness, in tradition in Bangladesh is uh, to give um, sweets to each other so that you have a good news. So all the sweet shops were empty in the first one hour. <laughs> <laughs> in the whole Dhaka city, there's no sweet meat left, they're empty, because people are buying up sweets to give to their friends. I have no idea who they are, but every single person, and people keep talking even years after. They talk about, you remember when you got the Nobel Peace Prize? I was in my office, and my boss called me up. Say, come here in my office. My boss never called me in his office. <laughs> I was scared. And he said, congratulations. I don't know why. Did I get a promotion? <laughs> no, your country, not Dr. Jonas, your country got Nobel Prize. I feel so tall. My boss called me in his office. <laughs> because of you. <laughs> Those kind of stories after stories, enormous varieties, even today. People say, ah, yeah, we are. You know, when you got the Nobel Prize, way back. Still repeat the whole story because it's so deep rooted in the person. He cannot forget that experience on that particular day. Wherever they live in the whole world, the first thing they will say, this is what I was doing at that time. I was driving my car to my office and suddenly I heard it in the radio. And then the rest of the story. What he, he turned around, he wanted to stay, go home, celebrate it, he didn't go out to office, <laughs> those kind of things. It's enormous, enormous happiness that brought. Thank you so much, sir. We are... Thank you. Thank you, Professor Yunus. So uh, we have many more questions, but I'm also aware of time. So we're running late, of course. <laughs> so uh, uh, some last remarks that we wanted to, to make uh, come from a person uh, that is here. You met her before. Uh, she's the co-founder of One Young World. And who better than Kate Robertson could make our closing remarks tonight? Beloved human being that you are. Um, I know everybody's tired. Professor Eunice, you come to us with hope. Now, he's a nice, loving, cuddly sort of guy. It's not about hope. I've learned with you over the years that you look at these young people in expectation. And expectation is a harder-edged word than hope. And it was Professor Eunice who taught all of us at the One Young World family about this generation being so powerful. The most informed, most educated, most connected generation in human history. And that is why we look to all of you, and indeed all of us dedicate so much time to your generation to say, you are our hope, but we come to you expecting great things. Now, the important thing, just quickly, and tonight, as we're in the arsenal of peace, we should be talking about peace. I was a few weeks ago with my colleague Stefan. We were in San Francisco. We went to the cathedral at the top of Knob Hill. There is a painting there commemorating the founding of the United Nations. 
and I stood in the pews in that cathedral and I cried to see these nations saying, we the nations have joined together to ensure that there will never be war again, having seen the devastation that it has visited upon people. And look where we are. So I would say to everybody listening tonight, let's pull everything together. You can get overwhelmed with a hundred ideas. But Professor Yunus said something incredibly important when he was talking about how the conditions that the three zeros would bring us are precisely the conditions that would guarantee no war. Absolutely vital. I never thought, at my great age, I never thought that we would be in a Europe that is on the brink of conflagration. This is how important the work of peace is. And every part of three zeros is critical. COP is coming up. COP, oh, where do I start with frustration? However, it's not enough to scream and shout the odds about COP. The important thing is this. At the last COP, the rich nations committed $100 billion to helping other nations not go down the path of lots of carbon, okay? The money has not been delivered, or a very small portion. So everybody in this room tonight, every single one of us from every country, whatever country you come from, find out how much, if you're from a rich country, how much did your government commit? How much has it delivered? And start asking the question, where is the money? If you come from what is called the developing countries that are expecting to get those funds, get hold of your government and ask them, how much money did you get? And if you got it, where is the money? It's no good every time we talk about zero carbon, every time we talk about getting there, everyone goes, oh, but you know, the poor countries need to get the money from the rich countries. You know what? Big excuse. The rich countries just go, ha, ah, no, we're not having this discussion. Follow that money, okay? Absolutely critical. This is towards zero carbon. This is something that Professor Yunus said just earlier also about when he said to all of us, pay attention. Pay attention and make sure that you are intentional. When you start your three zeros club, be intentional. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? To tell you something else. We have to understand we have to have this thing, this culture of peace, and we do not have that thing today. We do not have that thing. Social media, when you say the word in English, when you use the word hate, you'll get half a million likes. Use the word love, one or two. The algorithms are set to do that. So, when you use social media, are you going to be intentional? Should you even be using it? Think about it. Work it out. Do the thing deliberately. As Professor Eunice says, we choose. Not somebody there. We choose. There is work to be done here in the arsenal of peace to make sure that every three zero club, every three zero person is itself a weapon of peace. We have to go towards peace. And all I would say to everybody, when it comes to peace now, at this time of great, great danger, where we may never have peace, every single one of us has to get in the trench and fight for peace. It means fighting for three zeros, intentionally, raising your hand, where is the money? What happened here? What did you do? Why did you do that thing? And when it comes to business, and this point is critical, and it's come up so much tonight, you have created change. Really, Professor, you have created change. When you talk about Patagonia and Yvon Chua, you are one of his, his inspirations. You know this. You have created change. The movement in big corporates toward ESG, 
must not become a CSR byword. ESG matters, it matters. What is happening in the corporate world? We are starting to see the beginning of the end of shareholder primacy, which is what you've always asked for. We start to see the beginning of the end, so think about this. Think about this when you talk to your friends in big corporations. Where is their ESG? Are they taking care of all stakeholders or only the very rich shareholders? Every one of these steps matters, but I would urge you to think of three zeros as being a weapon for peace and understand every one of you, especially you young ones, we have to fight for peace. We cannot have peace in a world where leaders of countries are heads of criminal enterprises. There will be no peace. So I would urge all of you to be, I don't even want to say your soldiers, but you've always said to us to do everything. Get in this fight in the trench. Get in the fight for peace. But as Professor Eunice always says to all of us, and it is a burden, but it does lighten the burden, to do it with joy. Let love rip, then hate can't win. Let love rip. You have done that for all of us. Beloved Professor, thank you. And with that, uh, with that message, so we will all be weapons of peace, three zero people, and I think we can end tonight and we see each other tomorrow morning. We start at 9, but please registration starts at 7.30 until like, we, we have a lot of people to drive in, uh, in, the, in the summit. So, well, everyone, thank you for coming here tonight. Thank you to be at the Arsenal of Peace and lots of love for everyone. Uh, for those who want at the exit, there is a publication of Ceramic in English. You can take it with you. And thank you again, everyone.